Hello, I'm Robin Mitchell and this is EFM Electronics for Makers. In today's episode, we're going to be looking at the ROS directive and why it can affect makers. So what is ROS? Well, the first thing is you're going to hear some people pronounce it as ROS. They're wrong. It's ROS, R-O-H-S, not R-O-S-H. Anyway, besides that, ROS stands for the Reduction of Hazardous Substances and it's an EU directive that essentially says you can't have these chemicals in your products. Now, typically known to engineers as the lead-free directive, it's a bit more involved than that. And the chemicals that you can't put in products or specifically electronic products include lead, mercury, cadmium, hexavalent chromium, PBB, PBDE, DEHP, BBP, DBP, and DIBP. Now, the reason why I say it's a bit more involved than just the lead-free directive is because there are many people out there who believe that if a product doesn't contain lead, it's ROS compliant. But unfortunately, that's not actually the case because of the listed chemicals that we just saw, some components are actually non-ROS compliant. Now, one of the most common components that is not ROS compliant is the LDR. That tiny little light dependent resistor that you use in your projects that can detect falling light and then adjust as needed to maybe something like a, an automatic door opener. Yes, they contain cadmium sulfide, which is on the ROS list, which means you can't put them in products, with some small exceptions, of course. I think they tend to be military in nature or medical because those environments need high quality components and they don't want to faff around with things that might be partly dangerous. But that's, off the, that's a different topic. The point is, there are many components out there that are not ROS compliant and cannot be put into products. So how does this affect makers? Because surely a maker is not going to be interested in things like the ROS directive, which only applies to commercial products, right? Well, you'd be wrong. Now, the ROS directive can affect makers when a maker, let's say, designs something really cool and goes, right, I want to sell this on Tindy, eBay or some other sort of website. So they put the thing together, they build it, they sell a couple of units and they think, great, people start to like my product. But of course, this is where legislation comes in. So if they sell their products in the EU market, suddenly ROS applies. So let's say a maker designed an automatic door opener for chickens outside and they use an LDR to detect the ambient light, which then controls some kind of motors. That contains cadmium and suddenly not ROS compliant, so you can't sell it on the market. And suddenly you've broken the law. So when it comes to makers and ROS, it's not so much that it's going to affect your immediate DIY projects, but if you have plans or want to take your projects further, you may need to actually consider the ROS directive. So this is where makers need to think about how they can swap parts around for ROS compliant parts. But this is where the issue comes in. Some components such as the LDR don't actually have a drop-in replacement. So you can't just say, oh, okay, I'll get a ROS compliant version of an LDR. They don't exist. What you have to do is you have to design a circuit using alternative parts to produce the same function. So in the case of the LDR, you can use the photodiode. A photodiode in reverse bias mode with a resistor and an op-amp on the outside. You can Google these, there's hundreds of example circuits, but you can use one of those to replace an LDR but it's not a drop-in replacement. So you couldn't really put a photodiode in a potential divider circuit and have it produce the same output as say, one of those typical cadmium sulfide LDRs, but you would have to design your circuit differently to account for that. But at least in that situation, it would be ROS compliant and therefore it would be sellable. So while using ROS compliant parts does mean that your product is you know, good for the environment and for your own health, but it also future-proofs your designs. Suddenly, a DIY project that you've designed and built, which could be really, really useful, something that you decide to turn into a commercial product, you suddenly can with relative ease. So you've got a product, it's ROS compliant, surely you should be in the clear. Well, unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case, as there's another directive that may also apply called REACH, which stands for Registration, Evaluation, Authorization and Restriction of Chemicals. Now, REACH is concerned with up to 200 chemicals on a list known as the substance of very high concern. Now, while components may be ROS compliant, they may contain components on the CVHC list. Now, when this happens, you may have a problem with distributors because you might build a really cool product that everyone wants and is ROS compliant, but a manufacturer or distributor may not want to touch it with a barge pole if it has chemicals on the CVHC list. 
And believe it or not, even though these chemicals are not on the ROS list, they can include carcinogens and chemicals that are toxic for reproduction. So unless you don't want kids, they can be quite nasty. Now there's another aspect of ROS as well, which is projects that involve with food and sort of other consumable substances such as liquids like Coke or fizzy drinks, oh, I don't know. The point is, if you are gonna make a project that handles these things, you really wanna make sure that it's at least ROS compliant throughout the entire design. Lead-free solder, absolutely. ROS compliant parts, go for it. Really do try to avoid anything like lead solder and do avoid components that are not ROS compliant because if they're not designed to be consumed like lead or cadmium, don't put it in your project. It's quite self-explanatory. I don't think I have to explain why you don't want to be consuming those. Now, the last thing is about how do you check for ROS compliance? Well, there are a number of ways. Number one, only purchase from manufacturers and distributors who actually have the documentation. So, for example, most normal distributors, you can say to them, hi, I've purchased this ROS compliant resistor. Please give me the ROS certification and they will give you a ROS certificate. Now, a ROS certificate could be one of two things. It could be a simple declaration saying that the company says, we believe that these are ROS compliant because the manufacturers told us they're ROS compliant. And you can use that as a document for proof because if it turns out that it's not ROS compliant, you can sue the distributor. The second one is to actually ask the manufacturer themselves and they'll almost always have a certificate that goes in depth the process of how they test it. And that could include the chemical steps that they use, the different testing types. They will show pictures of the product being tested and the detection levels of those different chemicals. The last one is that you can actually send your stuff to a test house. Now there are quite a lot of them out there. You can simply Google Ross testing service and you'll find different companies and the price ranges for those vary quite a lot, but I have actually found one company that would do them for about 30 pound a piece. So you might think that's quite expensive, but it could also be the difference between knowing your product is actually ROS compliant and has all the documentation to prove it, and having something that may or may not be ROS, you're not quite sure, and then you find out 10 years down the line, it actually had, had something it was not supposed to have, and you could be potentially liable for that if you produce and sold a product. So that was a simple overview of ROS or the reduction of hazardous substances and why it might be important for makers to appreciate. Now, I know it's super tempting to get components in bulk from China, or dead cheap on eBay for a pound for 100 LN358s and think, wow, these are great, but then you find out that they're not ROS compliant or you can't use them in a commercial product or they might contain chemicals that can make you ill. And I know it's really tempting because it's cheap, but it's just not worth it in many, many scenarios especially the fact that they tend to be counterfeit parts anyway. So that is all we're gonna to cover today in this episode of EFM for Ross. Thank you for watching and see you next time.